Welcome to the iTrax Market Research Celebrity Series. Thank you for joining us. This is an annual event that iTrax runs to showcase the talent within iTrax network of market research professionals. My name is Garnett Weber. I'm one of the founders of iTrax and I am excited to host today's session. Liz Van Patten will be doing our presentation today. Shifting discussion boards into high gear. Supercharge your concept development with feedback cycles among brands, researchers, and consumers. This webinar will include case studies as well as recommendations on how to leverage online discussion boards and insight communities to discover powerful consumer insights and trim research timelines. As questions come up, please enter them into the chat area of the GoTo platform. We will discuss questions as they come up as well as following the webinar presentation. Liz Van Patten, the presenter today, is a highly regarded innovative online researcher. Liz has been a user of iTrack software for many years and it is our pleasure to host her in today's webinar presentation. She is an accomplished qualitative research consultant and strategic partner with a solid track record of generating marketing insights for Fortune 500 companies, ad agencies, government organizations, and industry groups. Liz has become well known in the market research industry for her expertise in online research and leadership in the development of online research methodologies since she began conducting research online in 2000. She is an acknowledged expert in the use of asynchronous methods such as online bulletin boards, online diaries, interviews using mobile devices, and market research insight communities, as well as real-time methods including webcam and text-based online focus groups. Liz has designed and executed both domestic and international online studies for concept testing, understanding path to purchase decision making, new product development, branding and positioning development, and communications research. Her clients have included industry leaders in financial services, technology, telecom, e-commerce, consumer packaged goods, retail, pharmaceuticals, healthcare, recreation, home appliance and furnishings, and energy. A popular speaker and writer on the topic of online qualitative research, Liz has been a guest lecturer in the graduate program in cosmetics and fragrance marketing and management at the Fashion Institute of Technology and currently serves on boards of two industry associations, the Qualitative Research Consultants Association and the New York chapter of the American Marketing Association. It is our pleasure to host her in today's iTrax Market Research Celebrity Series webinar. Go ahead, Liz. Well, thank you, Garnett. Thank you for that lovely introduction. And um, welcome. Welcome to um, everyone who's attending. Um, I, I wanted to get us started by uh, just getting a sense of how familiar the group is with um, online methods. So, Garnett, if you can uh, deploy that poll, that would be great. And Garnett's going to push a few buttons and get things uh, started here. Is the poll up now? Yeah, the attendees are viewing the poll. Okay, great. <clears throat> and what are we get? I can't see the results right now. So what are, what are we getting in terms of familiarity? All right. So we are at 30% um, of the group is has a high level of familiarity. And around 56% uh, have moderate, and then um, and then the last few have limited. So I say mostly in the um, moderate. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm going to uh, just close the poll. Most of the people have voted at this point, and I'll just right. share, share the results here. That's great. You know, when I first started doing online qualitative, <laughs> the, the numbers were very reversed. You know, it was a it was something new, and I, and I, you know, for me, the the moment of realization came when when I started getting calls from clients and prospective clients saying, "Hey, I hear you do this online qualitative thing," and I knew that uh, I knew that the world had shifted when that started happening. Okay, so um, as Garnett mentioned, we're going to talk a little bit about um, uh, sort of some best practices for. Um, online qualitative, especially discussion boards. I'm a huge fan of discussion boards as a technique. And then I'm going to share some examples of um, 
of some projects that I've worked on and how you can take this sort of basic idea of a discussion board and really ramp it up and make it much more productive and much more engaging and involving for client teams as well. So for the 4% of you or whatever it was who aren't that familiar with um, online discussion boards, here's what's unique and what's special about them. They take place over multiple days, which means that we can bit the information and, and feed the questions um, in very small pieces over the multiple days. The other thing that I like about that is it gives uh, participants a chance to go away, to think about things, um, <clears throat> and then to, to come back. Um, so you get a, a more thoughtful kind of response from the participants. The other great thing about, about online discussion boards is that people can log in on their own schedule. So it's much easier for people to participate. I find this very useful for busy people, whether it's new moms or whether it's a B2B project where we're talking to sales managers or executives or someone in the medical field. People can kind of fit the schedule to their own, their own lives. Um, they tend to be a little bit larger than a focus group, so somewhere around 15, sometimes as few as 12, sometimes a little bit more, but generally that 12 to 15 people is the real sweet spot. The other thing I like about online discussion boards is that it levels the field for all participants, and, and here's what I mean by that. You know, in an in-person, uh, in face-to-face focus group, we've generally only got two hours, sometimes less, and We've all seen it happen. Whoever talks the loudest, talks the fastest, tends to very easily dominate the conversation. Uh, but because this online discussion board method is asynchronous, there literally are no time limits. People can say as much as they have to say, and it makes, um, makes for a really rich discussion. You don't have to keep cutting people off and moving along because we're running out of time to devote to one topic. The downside of that is that we wind up with very extensive transcripts, so it does take a little bit of extra time to do the analysis, but there's a very rich, rich amount of data that's um, produced. They're also very flexible. Obviously, discussion, the text-based discussion is kind of the basis of it, but it's very productive to give people activities and exercises to do, go shopping, come back and report. Um, go cook a meal in your home and take photographs and, and show and tell us how that went. Also very easy to go back and probe and get people to respond and to a follow-up question. And we can have them do online journaling. Um, and I'll give you some examples of how that works as we go through the case studies. At this point, the history of online discussion boards is very strongly in text-based, but the world is going mobile and everybody has a smartphone or an iPad, so it's really easy now to give um, video responses or video-based activities. And that's the, the, the current exciting new development in online discussion boards. They're just becoming you know, this multimedia feast of, of information. So that's, a, that's the latest thing. Um, I particularly like discussion boards. I think they're excellent for concept development. And here's why. It's really easy to show any kind of media, text, images, video. We can link to a website. Um, very simple to do. The other thing, and this is something that clients really enjoy about the discussion board method, is we have a lot of control over whether participants can see each other's posts. So we can do anything from making it a completely open discussion to having it closed, where the participants only see their own responses. But the one that's really handy for concept development is sort of a partial masking thing, where somebody logs in, they open up a question, they see the moderator's question, but they only see um, their own response. Uh, they only see other people's responses after they have posted their response. So as soon as they respond to that question and post their response, then all the other responses of what people are saying come up. So you can get kind of the best of both worlds. You can get that unbiased initial response and then do some things to stimulate group discussion and shared observations after you've captured that first response. Easy to combine discussion boards with other methods, with surveys, with in-person work. Um, very simple to do that. You can kind of plan discussion boards at some point in, in a more extended hybrid kind of approach. And I find, and this is really, you know, the, if there's a key point to this presentation, this is the key point. The, the 
best use of discussion boards is when clients are highly engaged. It, it really it, it, it multiplies the usefulness and the productivity of a discussion board when clients are really involved. It, it's exponential numbers. Um, and I find it a little bit frustrating um, because so many clients approach a, a, a discussion board as somewhat similar to an online survey. You know, you kind of push the button and it goes and, oh, just send us the report and the transcripts when you're done. Well, you know, everybody's really losing out if you, if you view it that way because there's so much more to be gained when clients are really highly engaged. We can get this feedback loop that really boosts productivity. And I've just tried to simplify it here. You know, right in the center of the screen, we, we learn from consumers. And then if client, the client team is really engaged, the client team can act on that learning. And that can happen spontaneously, or we can really build that into the design. And, and again, I'll give you some examples of that. Then we take what, how we've, the way that we've tweaked the concepts, take them back to consumers to confirm, to build on them. And this can go through one uh, loop like that, or we can go through multiple iterations. Very flexible. And it just it, it gives you that, that co-creation um, possibility that discussion boards really, really work beautifully for this. Um, so I've said, I've really been stressing the idea that client engagement is, is so important and needs to be built into the research plan. You know, we've, we've got a chat window here. I'd love to have um, your thoughts about, uh, just enter it into the chat window. What would you do to boost client engagement in a discussion board? What are some of the things that come to mind for you? And just Liz, enter it. Into now, your... if uh, Liz has uh, put the question, uh, pose that, so you'll notice a, a chat area at the bottom of your GoToWebinar panel. So if you can uh, put some comments in there regarding um, what you would do regarding client engagement. And while everyone's um, commenting on that, Liz, a question has come up. Uh -huh. How do you manage the confidentiality of some concepts? Uh, when some things are online, they are there for many eyes to see. Uh -huh. Well, all the platforms, uh, all the discussion board platforms are password protected. So there is that level of protection. Um, the developers, the software developers are getting smarter about ways to defeat um, being able to take a screenshot. So there are some built-in security controls. You know, somebody can sit there with their smartphone and take a picture of the screen. Yes, we can't prevent that. but. You know, when you really, when you come down to it, and, and the other thing we do is that we ask people, you know, as you would in a focus group, you know, we ask people to sign a, an NDA agreement before they participate. So there are some controls that that we can, you know, some steps that we can take. But you know, what I tell clients is, you're really running a similar risk when you expose concepts in a focus group. You know, you once once you put it out there, people see it, and and we can, you know, do as much as we can to control and to try to keep it under wraps and to try to keep people from, you know, from sharing it. But um, it's, it's, you know, it's a risk that we have to, have to live with. So we try to do the best we can, but still, you know, you're exposing concepts and, um, and hopefully all those safeguards work. So um, I'm not seeing any suggestions in chat. Do we have any, uh, maybe I have the wrong box selected. Garnett, are we getting suggestions? Yes, we are. We've got oh. a, uh, yeah, we um, have a few here. So conduct debriefs at the end of each day. Share with participants. They will get to see how the responses line up with those of others. Mm -hmm. Treat it like a workshop, brainstorming session, and be sure they can log in throughout to see insights mm -hmm. and inputs. Mm -hmm. Opportunity to let to let sponsor company know how you really feel, make your suggestions to them. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Send them the transcripts. Mm -hmm. uh, let them watch the session anytime. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then there uh, yeah then there's a few questions, but we can uh, get into those. Let's stick on the client engagement topic. <laughs> okay, great, great, great. That's great. Well. Um, yeah, we heard a lot of the, the things that I do. Um, you know, a few years ago, I, I did a, a small-scale study with um, with qualitative research um, consultants and with some 
uh, users of, of qualitative research on, on debriefing. And you know, we've all done debriefs, but it really was an eye opener for me in terms of how to integrate debriefs throughout the presentation, uh, throughout the project. And one of the things that that um, came through loud and clear was you need the, the the researcher really needs to set the stage for client involvement and for debriefs right from the beginning. You know, so even in the proposal phase, even when you're getting the project all set up and and briefing with the client on what to expect. Describe the methods and the benefits of, of client participation, why it's so important, and make sure to plan a demonstration. Give the clients an opportunity, and, and most vendors are happy to do this, to set up a demonstration board so the clients feel comfortable logging in and they see how it works. Um, then uh, often it's very useful to plan in some time off, you know, because these discussion boards take place over several days. Build in a blank day, especially if it's a concept um, evaluation, a concept de development project. Build in that blank day to integrate what you're learning from the discussions. Or even on a more limited level, leave some blank space in the discussion guide. I always try to do that. Leave, you know, This is deliberately blank because we're going to incorporate follow-up issues that come up or follow-up questions that come up on this second day or third day. Um, it's also very useful to give client team um, observers specific listening and reporting assignments, whether to observe um, one topic or break up the group of participants and give them one participant to observe and to report on. And that makes them more accountable to participate in this 20-minute debrief call each day during the discussion. And that can happen either midday. I like to do the midday because then that gives the moderator some time to incorporate questions and incorporate changes as we go into the afternoon and the evening. But 20 minutes does it. 20 minutes does it. It doesn't have to be a long call. And, and I try to get the, those calls booked into the observing team's schedule as soon as possible. Or hybridize. Combine discussion boards with other methods that give give the client team some opportunity to digest what they're learning before we go on to the next method. Uh, or another, you know, if you really want to blow it out, expand um, the idea of a discussion board to a community with 50 or more participants and, and run it over three weeks, um, or it could be more. Some uh, some communities are permanent, some last several months. Um, so just expand thinking of how you're going to approach that. <clears throat> um, so now I'm going to share some examples of how we've used discussion boards to really build extra um, productivity into concept development work. So this first one is an example from the healthcare area. This was a, an elder care positioning project. And the issue was there was a skilled nursing home that wanted to expand its um, in-home geriatric care management function. And this was among private pay people because it was, um, it was going to be some cost involved. Um, the objectives of the research were to um, provide some guidance for messaging and also some input on what the, what the services, what the combination of services should be in terms of these at-home services that could be offered. So the question areas were we wanted to check to see which um, resources in, in the uh, in the area people were available, uh, were familiar with. We wanted to inform development of messaging and what that service package should be. That was really the key objective. And also to assess the impact of the, um, the parent home uh, brand. The challenges were that we had a limited budget to work with and we had a very tight time frame, of course. What else is new? Most projects work that way. So our target group was uh, healthcare decision makers. Um, they were women, um, sandwich generation, women with elderly parents. Um, high income, high net worth, because this was a private pay. And the work was conducted in, um, in Manhattan and some of the upscale suburbs around the area. And we decided, because of this need to develop these concepts on a fairly tight time schedule, to do a four-day discussion board. And here's how it played out. The first day, the topics we discussed were the challenges of managing that elderly parent's care and awareness of resources that were available in the New York City area. Then we showed three positioning concepts. And they were, they were based on some you know, slightly different approaches to what could be the central idea. 
one was based on a peace of mind idea, peace of mind for the parent, peace of mind for the family. Another was based on this idea of customized care, that the family could customize a personalized care plan for that elderly parent. And then the other one was kind of that crisis, you know, mom's fallen and broke her hip, what do we do now? Um, then we took a day off. No online discussion, but the client team was very busy incorporating what we learned on those first two days and revamping and optimizing the strongest concept to emerge. And then we went back on day four, got a response to an extensive list of services that could be offered to kind of fine tune that service offer and revisited the optimized concept just to make sure that we had incorporated some of the things that we had learned from the first two days. So the outcome was very successful. This customized care concept was optimized and really became even more relevant to the uh, to the participants on that final day. So that customized uh, single source plan had the most value. That was a key thing that we found out on day one and day two. Um, we also found out that compared to other resources in the area, that idea of supporting the decision maker as they went forward managing the care of an elderly parent, that could really help differentiate this service um, from some of the other competitors in the area. But the thing that was missing was that some of the services and what this um, provider would be responsible for weren't always clear to, um, to the healthcare decision maker. So that needed to be strengthened. And um, so we took that strengthened concept message into the final day emphasizing those things, bringing together the long history of the, the sponsor brand, and helped um, explain in very understandable language what the, um, what the, some of the services were. Um, and then we also found out about the parent brand and um, suggested that, that that would be best as an endorsement. There was kind of low awareness, but among people who were aware, very positive um, regard for this parent brand. Um, very strong history, but it was seen as a bit outdated, so they wanted to sort of back away and be an endorsement, not a very strong um, brand in terms of bringing this in-home care uh, package forward. <clears throat> and some terms, specifically geriatric care management services, needed to be more clearly communicated. Again, you know, in any field, there's very specialized language, so that needed to be revamped in more understandable layman's language. And, and here's just an example of how that positioning was executed on the website. So you'll, you'll see here that there's a very strong feeling of individual care. There's wonderful photographs of two seniors, a uh, war hero and a poet, and the headline is customized senior home care services, uh, home medical alerts, and elder care in the New York area. So this is just a landing page for this um, service as it was eventually teased out. Um, do we have any questions, Garnett? Yes, we do. Uh, there's a question that's come up. Um, is there any such thing as an over-involved client? An over-involved client? Um, well, in the 14 years that I've been doing online discussion boards, that happened to me once. <laughs> what, what was supposed to be um, what was supposed to be a one-day, very quick in and out discussion board? Um, yeah, the clients were really, and I. I I think what happened was they had a very limited amount of time and they, they, they wanted to really tweak things and get a reaction on some packaging and and it it really was too much. You know, I, I generally prefer clients to be involved and as I said a few minutes ago, the thing the thing I struggle with is clients who just sort of push the button on a on a um, a discussion board study and then are, are you know, just wait for the report to come in. But it is possible to overdo it, yeah, because because I do encourage client feedback, and most platforms have have some sort of mechanism where clients come in and observe and can post a message to the moderator. Um, it, it can get out of hand. The most effective way I've found to deal with that is to assign one point person on the client team, especially if it's a big team or a very involved client team. If, if as a moderator, I can deal with one person, that's really helpful because they can you know, they can filter through if there are three people asking the same question three different ways. That point person can focus it um, as we go ahead. 
Great suggestion. Thanks, Liz. I have another question. Uh-huh. Okay. Um, did you ask respondents about all three of the positioning concepts? Also, with a day off, do you see any break off? Um, we did ask about all three, yeah, because we wanted to to get their reactions to all three. They were they were simple, you know, one page with a uh, an image and and a description. Um, I tend not to see any fall off. I think this is what you mean, fall off in participation. What I find with discussion boards, if 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 the topic is right, if it's a high involvement topic for people and the recruiting is done right, and we've got people who want to talk about whatever that topic is. And, and specifically with the elder care um, study, I, that almost was through the roof in terms of, of respondent engagement. I mean, this is something that these, these women were dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. So not only were they highly engaged, but they were telling stories to one another. They were sharing about, you know, try this resource, try that resource. People who are in a situation like that, a life situation like that, want to talk to other people who are going through the same thing. You know, I've done a lot of work with people who are dealing with you know, various kinds of issues. And once they get involved with the other people, they can't wait to come back. So, and, and actually what I've seen over the years is, is attrition rates getting lower. You know, we always rec over recruit and we always lose one or two. But just last week, I did two um, discussion boards, and we recruited 20 for each board. In one board, all 20 completed the project, and in the other one, 19 out of the 20 completed the project. So it tends to be a very engaging process for the participants. Um, and of course, you know. I, I, as a moderator, I work at keeping them engaged and trying to keep them interested, but um, they're, they're, the fall off tends to be um, not that not that big of a problem. Shall we go on? Yes, yes. Thank you. Great. Okay, good. So this one is from a few years ago. This one was a search engine repositioning project. And this was a very specialized search engine that had acquired some other technologies, and they wanted to reposition their brand. Um, and one of the things we wanted to learn about was how do users search? How do they do it? What, what, what steps do they take? What do they get out of it? Let's get them talking about it. Um, and we wanted to help the client develop a positioning for this integrated offering, integrating these new technologies. So we were interested on you know, the feedback, on the, um, the rewards and the problems of search, and again, getting reactions to those feature-based positionings. The challenge here was that um, this client needed to differentiate themselves as a small player in the world of internet search because we all know who the big one is now. And again, this was a few, maybe, I don't know, six years ago. Um, so our target group was internet search engine users, covered a range of ages, uh, frequent users of internet search, and uh, they were recruited to uh, use search for a wide range of reasons. Some used it for work, also personal interests, hobbies, that kind of thing. We did three days worth of discussion board, and the, the first day was a journaling activity. Um, so there were no questions posted. They weren't responding to one another, but we gave them an activity that uh, said, log on two or more times, do two or more internet searches, and just kind of make notes on what happened, what worked for you, what didn't work for you, uh, and then we'll come back the next day and, and talk about that. But the journaling was done online, so we had their their journal captured in the moment responses to their whole experience of doing those internet searches. Came back on day two, had them debrief a bit on the search exercise, and we got their reactions to three positioning concepts. Now, the positioning concepts were very strongly feature-based. You know, we've, anybody who's worked in the tech field knows that tech tech people love to talk about features. But what we found through the journaling and through the discussion of the journaling was that people weren't into the features. There was more to be more rewards for these people who used internet search than just the features. So because we saw that happening, the client team was really on top of that. And by the third day, they had developed a new values-oriented positioning that, that no one had really expected we would, we would wind up with when we started. So, and that, that 
concept that they developed coming out of those first two days was more meaningful. What we found out was that internet searchers were more driven by the, the outcome than the features. And that whole process of search had a very strong emotional component to it. It, 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 it generated feelings of exploration, discovery, a certain amount of freedom in the democracy of, of internet search. And this client team was able to take that and spin it into a new, more values and emotion-driven concept that really excited people. So they, they were able to, and, and bless them for doing this, they were also able to scrap that features-based concept and create something new literally overnight that really excited people. Um, I wish I had something to show you for this one, but this, you know, it's the internet world, it's the technology world. This company has now gone through, you know, I think they've been swallowed up by a couple other companies, and this brand and positioning and name is no longer in existence. But I, I like that story because the client was so responsive, and they were they were involved, and they were able to create something new literally overnight, and uh, we were able to work with that and go on. There's, uh, I have a yeah. question here. Mm -hmm. Uh, were the journal entries shared amongst participants? No, they aren't. What, by journaling, I mean that it's really like a diary. They can only see their own journal entries. Um, and that's a control in, um, in, in most of the um, discussion board platforms. The moderator can set that control. So participants see the questions, they see their own entries, and that's it. That's all they see. Um, then they came back and they reported on it, which was interesting to see. You know, the moderator and the client team can see the journals, but the other participants can't. So it's interesting to see what they capture in the moment and then what they choose to share on the following day. Just as a sidelight, that's also the setting we would use for um, online in-depth interviews, which we can do. Uh, um, just set that so they could only see their own answers and do some online in-depth um, work. Uh, so let's, yeah, another question. Yeah. Um, can you give an example of the search exercise? Mm, well, we we kept it very loose. We, I, as I recall, we said something like, you know, there won't be any questions today. We want you to to log in, and and this was all, you know, these instructions were all given within the discussion board. But at some point during the day, use your computer and do two internet searches. You can use whatever search engine you want, you can search whatever topic you want for whatever purpose, and then just keep um, keep a record of that in, in your journal. Use this discussion board as a journal. Um, so that, we because we, we wanted to learn, we wanted to keep it very wide open, um, we can do something much more specific. You know, I do a lot of work with a company that does um, retail work. And we give assignments to people to go out, go shopping. And uh, this is a great use that's coming into um, um, more and more use all the time for mobile. You know, go shopping, take your mobile phone, take some pictures of the shelf in this specific category that we're working with that we want to understand better, and post the pictures that you take. And I really want to see some pictures of um, a display that you saw that was easy to shop and make sure your pictures really give us a good example. You come come back prepared to talk about why this particular aisle was easy to shop. And also take some photographs of aisles that are hard to shop and use it as a visual example to show us what made this one hard to shop. So we can be very wide open or we can be very specific. Shall we go on? Uh, well, I've got. Do you want a couple more questions, or do you want to save them more to, for, to, for the end? You know what? Let's let's move on because I want to make sure that we uh, that we have enough time to get through all the all the um, case histories. So this one was snack merchandising, and this um, this marketer wanted to look for some growth opportunities by by making more elaborate displays in the supermarket checkout area. Um, and this one was a hybrid. We combined these discussion boards with an online quantitative concept test. Um, and we wanted to help identify three out of five. There were five concepts in this concept test. And that we, so we wanted to help identify which three to take into a simulated market test. So the question areas for the discussion boards were, which concepts did they recall? What did they like? Did they have any expectation about pricing? How would they improve <clears throat> these concepts? And what uh, impression 
these concepts created about the retailer. So the need here was for deeper insights in understanding these concepts and to turn it around fairly quickly because it was, you know, these three phases and they were stacked up and had to move on without, you know, waiting a month for a report before they went into the test market. Um, <clears throat> so our target group was uh, snack purchasers, specifically people who bought snacks at the supermarket and ate those snacks immediately in the car on the way home or when they were on their way to class or, or whatever, but that was that right away was an important piece of it. <clears throat> and we looked for people who had a mix of uh, positive and negative responses in the, in the quant concept test. So we looked for people who were, you know, a, a range of liking for each concept and a range of purchase interest levels. Um, and again, it was a hybrid method. So uh, in the concept test, these five concepts were tested monadically, and then based on people's responses in that concept test, we invited them to go directly from the concept test into the online discussion board. Very quick, in and out, this was. One day discussion, because the, the topics were, were fairly focused, and um, people, because it was a monadic test, people in the one day discussion saw the same concept that they saw in the monadic survey. So it kept it really simple, really straightforward. Um, and <clears throat> we got three very clear winners from this, um, from this two-step phase as candidates for the simulated test market. Um, but we were able to expand on more, with more diagnostic findings on why they had performed so well in the survey and also provide some rich feedback for refinements prior to phase three. So the two versions of that healthy snack um, appealed um, because they offered, you know, here's healthy, healthy snacks if you're in the mood for that, but we haven't taken away all your chips and your gum and your chocolate bars. They're still there if you want to choose those. Um, the interactive one was interesting. Um, this was an early use of, of tablets, and um, that was what was involved in the concepts that they saw. And that performed well, that idea of um, being able to make choices through that interactive device. That was something new and, and engaging. Um, and both of those directions um, seemed like they would reflect well on the retailer that installed them. So some of the suggestions we made for refinements Again, coming out of these uh, discussion boards, a wider choice of healthy snacks, a selection of non-snack items, all those other, all that other stuff that's at the front of the um, supermarket. Don't forget my batteries and my Kleenex and my lip gloss and you know, all that other stuff that you find up there. Um, because the healthy snacks were, were um, some of them were fresh food, fresh fruits, fresh snacks. They wanted a, a date stamp to make sure that things were fresh. They wanted more product information um, about the healthful benefits of it. And one of the, the suggestions that came that, <clears throat> that could really bring these two directions of healthy snacks and interaction closer was to use the interactive technology to provide more product information right in the store. Um, so some neat um, refinements to take these concepts into, uh, into further testing. Let's just go through these. Um, and then we'll handle questions at the end. So the next uh, case study is uh, an e-commerce loyalty program. Uh, e-commerce site wanted to develop a loyalty program for people who were collectors of a specific kind of collectible. So they wanted to understand that category better and get reactions to this loyalty program concept. So some of the questions were, we wanted to find out more about the motivations and rewards of collecting. Um, wanted to find out what people thought of of this specific site and its competitors, and get some reactions to the, the concept of the loyalty program and its features. Um, some of the challenges in this case were this particular um, site could, could only do a limited kind of program. They couldn't do anything that would track points and allow people to you know, cash in points on some kind of reward or, or go in and track their account and track their activity. They were limited in tech, the technology of what they could do. And there was also con some concern that these collectors would be unwilling to share information about their hobby and about their collection. I, I got all kinds of warnings before we started 
you know, they, they might be a little embarrassed to talk about this. You might have to really do some digging, and, you know, they might not want to come forward. Well, just the opposite, you know, because they all collected the same thing. Again, that high involvement idea. They, they love talking to one another, and they love compared, comparing notes on their greatest find and how, how long they've been collecting and how they first got into it. So, you know, again, people, once they, they find themselves talking to a group of people they have something in common with and are, are fairly engaged in that interest, they just go. They, they really have a good time participating. So we recruited uh, people who were frequent uh, buyers of this specific kind of collectible, and we had a mix of, you know, within that frequent buyer, a little bit toward the lower end and up toward the higher end. And this was recruited from a client list because they had all that, that uh, usage information. So this one was a three-day discussion board with a follow-up um, a few days later. And we talked about um, you know, their habits online and offline, um, how they perceive various collectible sites, and kind of their personal history and motivations for collecting. Uh, that was the first two days. On the third day, we got their reactions to the loyalty program and the proposed features and benefits. And then we waited a few days, and we went back <coughs> um, with a Again, uh, 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 um, an optimized, new and improved um, concept description for the, uh, for the loyalty program. That was a smaller, separate sample, uh, and we showed them a revised version of the, the concept. <coughs> um, and we came up with a very strong concept and program features that are, this is fairly recent, they're now being um, uh, developed further. So some of the outcome here was we got a much better understanding of that collector mindset. We, we identified qualitatively what seemed like four psychological or motivational segments. And, and those four segments were the result of kind of this interplay of emotional and potential financial rewards. You know, some people were in the collecting because I'm building a collection and I'm going to sell it and I'm going to make some money on that. Other people had much more emotional um, ties to it. You know, for them, it was either the the thrill of the hunt, looking down that exact piece that they wanted to collect, or they had, you know, they had a parent who was a collector and they inherited a, a stamp collection or some other kind of collection. Uh, so there's an interesting interplay of um, you know concrete, tangible rewards and emotional rewards. Very good interest in the loyalty program idea, um, and they were. Fine. When we went back with the, um, you know, this fur further development, this kind of iterative development of the of the program, they were fine with discounts and rewards. Just some recognition for the idea that they were a fairly frequent um, purchaser on this site. The other thing that came out because they they related to each other as as collectors of this um, particular kind of object, that the the idea of a loyalty program even strengthen that idea that they they belong to a special group because they were knowledgeable about this category they had some experience they loved interacting with one another they they made suggestions for you know include a forum where we can go on and talk to one another if you when you set up this loyalty program um, the cautionary note here was that the rewards had to have some intrinsic value for them and had to have some connection to the topic that that was the center of their collecting activity. Um, they were not eager <laughs> to share information or to track points. They didn't want a complicated, you know, tracking exactly the kind of program that this client couldn't produce. Let me feel like I'm on a, in a part of a special group. Give me some some money off or some you know some dollars back at the end of the year. I'm fine with that. So it was an interesting learning and development um, experience. You know, the, the the client was very pleased that you know the stuff they couldn't do, the um, the collectors were not clamoring for. So that was a very positive outcome. And this um, <clears throat> uh, last uh, um, case history is a food packaging redesign program. Um, here, the, the issue was that it was an established food brand and they wanted to refresh its packaging. You know, like a lot of food brands, this particular product had multiple SKUs. They had a, you know, a low-fat version and a flavored version, and a, it was a, a many, many, many SKUs. And what tends to happen, 
those of you that are you know, involved with, with uh, consumer packaged goods, is we add on that new version and the packaging drifts further and further away from the look of the, the basic brand. So this client wanted to refresh its packaging, modernize it, and also create a packaging system that worked across these varied SKUs. Um, so we wanted to really start at the beginning and understand the equities of the brand and the, the then current packaging, explore some potential graphic elements that they could introduce and fine tune, and then come back and assess the communication profile of the new package that was going to be developed. So the challenges here, an untold, uncounted number of uh, multiple SKUs, really quite, quite a significant number. And the product was marketed in distinct regional markets where there were regional differences in terms of taste and preference in how this product is used. And there was also varied competitive sets across the regions. As I recall, I think there were seven different regions in the US. So our target was primary grocery shoppers, um, heavy users of this category and this brand specifically. Um, and we had a mix of brand loyalists Nope, that's my brand. That's the only one I use. I'm really happy with it. And people for whom this brand was one of a, a mix of a set of different brands that they used. And we had a sample of um, 20 people in each region. So that was a sample of 140, I think, we wound up with. So you can do some interesting quantitative stuff when you've got that kind of numbers. This was a six-week online community. Week one, we used to explore category, brand usage, how do you use this product, what are the brands you use, and then we drill down on their meaning and associations with this specific brand and its current packaging equities versus its competitors. Um, then at the end of that first week, we did an online survey, quantitative survey, assessing some imagery and communication themes that the client wanted to begin introducing to their new packaging, uh, package approach. Then we came back for one day only in that second week and did some integration, kind of some matching exercises because out of, coming out of the survey, we had a short list of imagery and themes that seemed like they were on target. Then the client team went away for six days and developed some new packaging design options. We came back again, so now we're up to the beginning of the third week, we took a look at six preliminary design approaches plus the current package. And we talked about what's the imagery they're communicating, what are they communicating about the product, how visible are they on the shelf, and how appropriate are they for this brand. Then, incorporating all of that information, the client team went away for one, two, three additional weeks and really refined, really fine-tuned that new logo really fine-tuned those five different designs. So we came back again for another two days and did a final check on those five re refined designs plus the current back package. Um, and the outcome here was a very clear direction for new packaging that worked across all the SKUs, across all the geographical regions. And what I really loved about this study is that it, it really involved that kind of back-to-basics approach to redesign, where we, we, in a sense, just put the current packaging aside for the moment, started out with consumer perceptions of the category, the brand, and the packaging. But we built in that constant feedback cycle with consumers in that online community. So we, had, you know, we would talk to them, do a survey, go away, create some designs, come back, get reactions to the rough designs, the preliminary design, go back for a couple of weeks, fine tune, improve, and then come back at the end of that six week period to to revisit and really confirm that that these design options were on track. And then after that, those design options went into survey, went into quantitative testing to really identify the, the strongest single direction. But that co creation process um, was working throughout that whole six-week period to, to develop that optimized package <coughs> with the optimized logo and the graphics and the, the um, communication about the variety and about the product. Um, so those are the case histories. We have about 10 minutes left, so let's, uh, let's hear those questions. 
Great. Thanks for the excellent presentation. All right, we do have uh, some questions uh, submitted, so we will um, uh, we will go into those now. Um, so, uh, first question here, um, and I believe um, this was um, more relating to the um, the snack uh, question. Mm -hmm. um, and the question was, um, do you deliver a different qualitative question set based on survey responses? Um, so were the were the qualitative? Let me make sure I understand it. Were the qualitative questions um, changed at all based on the survey responses? Is that the question? I want to make sure I yeah. understand it. Yeah. Um, well, in this case, there really wasn't time because we went directly from the survey into that one day discussion board. But um, certainly, if it's um, if it's an integrated hybrid study like that, I'll be working with the people who are designing the survey, and we'll make sure that you know, if time allows, we'll use feedback from the survey to inform the questions and the issues in the qualitative work as well. But the distinction I want to make is that, um, and I think this is something that any moderator who start or any researcher who starts moderating online discussion boards is that. The questions really have to function in a very different way. I, I like to think of them as a script because I try to write something that sounds to me like a dialogue, that sounds like a conversation starter rather than a quantitative question. So people must think I'm crazy. When I'm writing a discussion guide for a, for a discussion board, I'll read parts of it aloud. Just and listen to you know. Does this sound like a survey question, boring old survey question, or does this sound like the beginning of a conversation? So I hope that answers the question. <laughs> no, that's great. Okay. Uh, all right. Next question here. How do retailers feel about using phones to take pictures in their stores? Uh, they don't like it. They don't like it. Um, you know, unless it's it's they're the retailer who's sponsoring the survey. Um, but you know, I think they're getting more tolerant, and, and I've had some pretty brave uh, participants, consumers who, are, you know, willing to go out there and, and take the risks and say, "Oh yeah, I just wanted to just wanted to take a picture of it." You know what's happening? That they're becoming more tolerant because, and we all do it. You know, I just want to I just want to take a picture of this and email it to my partner. So, so she'll know what I'm talking about. People are doing that in stores now. You know, I want to take a picture of this, take it back, and show my child to make sure that that's the one they want. So, I think the resistance on the part of retailers is really, you know, <laughs> they're losing their resistance to it because we're all of us in in stores taking pictures. Mm -hmm. Uh, Liz, if I can just make a comment on that uh, from an ITAX perspective. Um, in, uh, in some recruiting uh, projects, uh, the, um, a common practice would be sending a letter um, uh, to the respondents and then they have a letter outlining uh, the research project and a, and a contact person. So if the store retailer uh, does have concerns, um, they can show them the letter, and then it outlines that it's a market research study and who the contact person would be. Mm -hmm. Good idea. Yeah, good idea. All right, on to the next question here. For concept testing, how many concepts do you usually recommend to be tested in a day and then slash over the whole session when you're using an online discussion board? Yeah. Um I like to cap it at three. I think three is about all you can do in a day, and actually, three or four is really all you can do in, a, in over the course of a project. Um, it, you know, and, and I, I just find that consumers get mentally fatigued when we throw too many concepts at them. So I try to push clients to develop concepts that are really single idea focused and really are distinct. You know, if it's a concept that, you know, here's an A version and a B version, yeah, right, we see the difference but the, between the A and B. But, you know, in terms of talking to the consumers, let's try to focus on that one central idea. So um, I really like to keep over the course of the study no more than three or four. You know, now if it's, if it's, it's an ongoing study, if it's a community and we're, 
we're filtering in new concepts all the time, but we're taking a break, that's different. But in any one module, you know, I really like to limit it to three or four. Thank you. Uh, next question, is there a way to blend the approach of online bulletin boards with online individual interviews? Um, oh, sure. Yeah, um, you can do that. You can, um, you know, discussion boards are endlessly flexible. Um, I, I'm trying to think of an example where I've done that. Um, but you just, you could say, you know, this particular, I know when I've done it, I've talked to, um, I've done discussion boards on um, fairly sensitive topics. Um, and we've gone back and forth between discussion, okay, this is a general discussion, and if there's anything that you feel embarrassed about talking in a more public way with the, you know, the dozen people that are in our in our discussion, put it here and put it in this in this individual. Only, you know, you'll see your response. I as moderator will see your response, but nobody else can see it. Um, so yeah, it is possible to blend them. I mean, it's it's all driven by the objectives of the study, but people can bounce back and forth between a group discussion and an individual interview. Super. All right. Uh, well, we have um, uh, reached the end of my list of questions here. Um, if you have more, feel free to uh, submit them, and we can definitely uh, follow up with you after. Liz, I want to express a sincere thanks for your very um, uh, insightful and innovative uh, pe presentation. Um, and I just wanted to mention to everyone, this is the last uh, session of the ITRAX uh, Celebrity uh, Research Series. And uh, all sessions were recorded, including this one. And they can all be accessed at the ITRAX website, so www.itrax.com slash webinars. And a follow-up email will be going out that will uh, contain a link to the uh, to all of the uh, celebrity series, including the one from Darby Swanson and Ben Smithy of uh, Spike Research. I do I do want to mention that it is really helpful for webinar presenters as well as uh, iTrax to receive feedback on the webinar. So you will have a very short, closed-ended three-question survey at the end when you go out of the GoToWebinar. And if you could just take, I'm estimating 12 seconds <laughs> to complete that, that would be really, really helpful. And uh, if you have additional questions, uh, you will receive contact information in the follow-up email. Feel free to uh, reach out to uh, Liz or myself, and we'll see if we can assist you in, um, in your research questions and your, your journey. Thanks again, Liz, for a great webinar. And thank you, everyone, for taking the time to join us today. Bye. <laughs>